Right. Can you hear me? No, you know. <laughs> but I don't get on the tape or something. Is it too real? It's down to you guys. Uh, let, let's start. I'm, one of the great things about being in this society is that you come across subjects you didn't know existed. Let, you could admit ignorance. You admit it. You have to admit ignorance of the subject. And this is one of today's for me. So I'm passing the buck to introduce it. Someone who does know something about it. And that's why David's on his feet. So David, would you please introduce your colleagues from the past? And uh, you, you can shout as well. And I'll, give this, yeah, I'll give this to you. Some of you can, some of you can't. <laughs> but if you were in, around the 60s in doing quotes, computer science, whatever you called it, you would, just, you would remember that there were two subjects you were taught. One was numerical analysis, which is what this is about, i.e. doing sums. And the other one was about everything else. <laughs> and uh, it was great fun. And uh, if you like, Brian and his colleague, uh, Mick Pond, are sort of, in my mind, they're sort of refugees from that old days. They're still in the, <laughs> the, 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 the mathematical part of uh, computing. Because it is quite remarkable that computers were built to do, do sums. Um, so it was in Cambridge. And uh, we never really thought about doing other things. In fact, we turned uh, a, a, coin, a, a terminology of talking about non numerical analysis. <laughs> And uh, the world was sort of split into two. The guy at Oxford who didn't believe in the non-numeric analysis. Fortunately, he didn't examine my thesis. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, Brian and his colleague uh, are already refugees from there. I don't know. They're still oh, yes. relics from there. Yeah. But they are still in numeric analysis, doing sums on computers, which you might think that's what it's for. It is, of course. So, if you are one of those people who were around in the 1960s, you should know something of what he's going to talk about. If you weren't, well, that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to introduce Brian Ford, who will introduce his colleague. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. I'm going to kick off, and I hope everybody can hear all right. Yes, yes thank you. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Mick Pont. Mick um, is still employed by the Numerical Algorithms Group, NAG. Um, I, I retired from them in 2004, although I've kept, I'm glad to say, contact with them. And in um, 18 months, two years' time, we'll be celebrating 50 years, uh, as, as you'll see. Um, the idea is I'm, I'm going to talk to you about the early days of NAG. Uh, in fact, I, for, for rather obvious reasons, I'm going to start before NAG's created and move through the period when it was, um, and, and then at, at a, a certain point when I'm exhausted, um, <laughs> and I hope you're not, um, uh, Mick's going to take over and, and, and bring us up to date. So um, it's del delightful to be invited. Um, a friend of mine asked, well, why have they asked you? I said, well, I'm a sort of relic. <laughs> um, and I think David's pointed out quite adequately why. So I think that's enough of that, isn't it? Um, so um, uh, Mick's going <laughs> to operate it for me. Five minutes ago. use technology right now. I'm going to turn it off and on again. It's lost the focus. That's it. That's good. All right, so I'm starting um, in, in the, in 67, um, but th this is basically what the, the talk's about. Um, you know, obviously creating numerical algorithms libraries enabled science and engineering to address the real mathematical models that needed solving. Um, 
And, and for many of them, um, it was when our library came along the first time, it was, an, as you'll see, an utter revelation. And it led to an absolute explosion of, um, of science and engineering. Um, I'll get rid of this now. We, we can trace contact with at least 26 Nobel Prize winners. Um, so the aim was to build um, a general purpose library and to meet the computational needs of, of university users. And the important thing there is the, the idea of the library was to help the users, not to help the numerical analysts. Um, and it was not a subject library, uh, like the people in Manchester were developing an ordinary differential equation group uh, body. It wasn't a topic library. Uh, at the same time, I was doing a PhD in quantum mechanics. Um, and it wasn't the result of the work of a particular numerical analysis group. And one of the most distinguished was the group at Harwell. Uh, we had contact with them and the people um, in um, the National Physical Laboratory. Um, so we set out to learn from our users which numerical areas they wished to be covered. And in Nottingham, where I was, there were about 26 departments at that time in the university who actually wanted access to the sort of material that we've got. It was, very, it was very broadly based. We even had an agricultural school who wanted it for their statistics. Um, and the, um, the library wasn't a haphazard collection. We just didn't tip everything into it and hope. The, from the beginning, it was always, we, we wished it to be, uh, sorry to read from the slide again, integrated, we wanted it ultimately to be complete. We're still working to make it complete, aren't we, mate? Oh, we are. Um, we wanted it to be consistently organized. Well, we were able to do that. The documentation was as important as the software. And we wanted it to be thoroughly tested. And what testing means, I'll cover uh, during the talk. But the result was, anyway, from that the library was created and an awful lot of science and engineering was completed. It also stimulated numerical analysis to be done in areas that users wanted th throughout the fields, going over into medicine, going over into economics, um, all sorts of other areas, even the broadly the social scientists. And, and, and it meant that the, the numerical analysis analysts could discover what algorithms they ought to be working on, what the demand was going to be. Well, I started quite late, as you'll have gathered from David's int introduction. David was already in his early middle age by then. <laughs> Um, but there's a paper by a man called Francis, um, I believe in, in one of your early journals, um, about the QR algorithm, which solved the eigenvalue problem. Um, and I read it and started doing a software implementation of it. At the time, I had a, a, a shared job between Mass and the Computing Center, and it, and it, it seemed obvious to me that what we needed to do was to have a, a numerical um, advisory service uh, set up for all the users in Nottingham. Um, and, and there are three components to the activity. There was collecting and building a library, there's preparing the documentation, and there's uh, creating an office where users could come and consult. And that was half my job, so, you know, it kept me busy. Um, and. Um, the machine we had was a KDF9, um, which was based obviously on Pilot Ace, designed by Turing, but actually built by Jim Wilkinson and other co colleagues at the National Physical Laboratory. And the beauty of it, it had true rounding. It's a 48-bit word. Um, and um, in Nottingham, we, we had completely saturated uh, computing use already, um, but we, uh, we wanted to, to move forward, we wanted to move up a gear. So I arranged for Wilkinson, <coughs> who was um, not only Turing's right-hand man, 
um, but the World Authority on the Algebraic Eigenvalue Problem, arranged for him to come to Nottingham uh, to talk about the eigenvalue problem. Um, and we had these two wonderful lectures with over 150 people each time coming to hear him speak. Um, and f for me, it was, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience because it meant that um, I created a friendship with Jim which lasted until his untimely death from aneurysm um, in, in 1986. Um, and the uh, Fox also was invited. Now Leslie never computed in his life on a, on a computer. He did everything on a hand machine. He was an excellent numerical analyst. Um, and an, an, another Yorkshireman, you know, the, the place was crawling with them. Um, and uh, so he sent David Mayers to, to, to give us a lecture and was e equally successful. And this really put us um, on, on our toes. There were amazing times. Um, I f first of all built the library. Um, the linear algebra I got from NPL, um, th this was Algor 60. The nonlinear optimization I got from Harwell, um, that was um, Fortran. Um, the quadrature I managed to get from Queen's University Belfast, because my supervisor. Um, George Hall was from Belfast. Um, I can't remember where the interpolation came from. We got a very poor piece of um, curve of surface fitting uh, work. The, the ordinary differential equations were from Nottingham and also from Manchester. And the random numbers were totally from Nottingham. We had a man called Henry Neve there who created them. Was the interpolation from uh, Jeff Hayes? At well, it was. You're quite right. Thanks. Um, oh, by the way, if I make mistakes, do, do tell me. Um, <clears throat> and if there is any burning question, do ask it. I'm perfectly happy to fold it in. Um, but there'll also be an area at the end of the seminar for, for, for that. So, well, sorry. So I've said half of that already, haven't I? Um, the, the, the important point on that slide is that the routines I put even in that first collection were the ones I'd learned that people um, in the University of Nottingham wanted. We didn't put anything in purely because we felt we ought to have it. Um, the routines um, were carefully tested. Some of them were sent home for reworking. Uh, and we wrote the user documentation systematically for all of them. And there's always an example test program. Um, it's, it's, it's a time I'll never forget. We have a place called the Playhouse in, 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 in Nottingham. And, and I went on one occasion with my then wife, um, she's a sociologist, um, and I was mobbed at, at half time. You know, we went to buy ourselves a drink, and I only got to half of the second half of the play because of all the people who'd come out to ask, which is. Um, may sound a bit affected, but it, um, it just underlined the demand there was and, and the, the eagerness. Um, and <clears throat> for the reasons shown in the last point. Um, and the, we, the, the, there was an experience at that time which is, is, is worth sliding at the, in at this point. So I'm, I'm working on the desk the second day, the, the, advise, the emeritus advisory desk. And this man comes over and says, you're a bloody liar. I said, pardon? I said, you're a bloody liar. Von Neumann in this book says the algebraic eigenvalue problem will never be solved. Look, it's here. <laughs> and you're claiming you've solved it. I said, well, look, here's a matrix. Here are the eigenvalues. Here are the eigenvectors. Is that a solution? And his face just lit up. And he went away. <laughs> Came back the next day and he, he gave me a matrix to look at and I said, well, that's, that's real and it's symmetric, but it's not real symmetric, positive definite. So I won't get such accurate answers as I would have done with the matrix I had yesterday, but yes, I can get the result. He was thrilled to bits. So you can actually solve it. 
Yes. So for the next 18 months, I worked with him and his postdocs and various people. And then we lost contact. And then in 2003, the phone rang. And this voice said, um, this is Peter Mansfield. You may have heard I've just got the Nobel Prize for nuclear magnetic I imaging. I just wanted to thank you for all that work all those years ago. So you see, it proves it, it pays to take care of your people. <laughs> so other universities have got KDF9s. Um, Linda working with Leslie um, on linear algebra. Um, she'd done quite a lot of work. Shirley was at Leeds um, doing a PhD with Roger Fletcher, who had a distinguished career in nonlinear optimization. Dear yeah, Joan um, was at Manchester, um, Joan Walsh, um, who was a, a first rank uh, numerical analyst. Um, well, I'll be saying a, a bit more about Joan later on. Uh, all of us, you know, including the Atlas at uh, Manchester, and there's somebody who ran it, I think, in, at the back there, that's right. Um, they were all already. Um, had insufficient resources for the, the, the organisations they belong to. I mean, the ICL 1906A clearly was going to solve all the world's problems. <laughs> so they, they, they gave up to 30% of the machine for people like David to play on, doing operating <laughs> systems. Um, and uh, but Eric, our, um, our director, um, was delighted to be in the same university list as those people, you can imagine. Um, and I had a meeting with Dave, with Eric, and he said, Brian, you've got to do a library for the 6A. I said, no, I don't want to. You know, I've, I've done one library, I've got a PhD to finish, and you know, I want, I want to, to teach mathematics. He said, but look, after all you've caused in the university with the interest in, in algorithms and stuff, the least you can do is put a library together. So I went home and I was, it was in February um, 1970 uh, in the bath, as, as one does, um, and, and it just came to me, all right, thinking through the names I mentioned earlier, all of whom I'd seen, if all of us could agree to work together collaboratively, we could build a really good numerical algorithms library. So we arranged a meeting at, at Nottingham, and um, it was 13th of May, 1970, and Eric chaired it. I put him in the, sorry, he was in the chair, so I could be free to really work hard in the meeting. Um, and it included Joan, Let Shirley, Linda, and Bart Fossey from um, Atlas Computing Lab in, in, in uh, Hull. Um, and at that first meeting, we agreed to collaboratively build a numerical algorithms library in Algol 16 Fortran. That was the compromise we had to strike. So we're going to have two language versions from day one. Um, and it's going to be on the 6A. Clearly, sorry, I'm going to read this through. Um, the, the base of the library was algorithms, each individually selected and coded it, then coded into both languages. The user documentation was important as a source code of the routines, and I'm going to keep saying that because remember, the library is for users. It's not for people who are doing the algorithmic work in other words. There'd be an example program in the documentation showing people how to, to call the routines. There was also a stringent test program which um, established the correct functioning of e each routine, but also showed the reasons for its selection. <clears throat> and right from day one, um, we had a, an error handling um, basis so that when errors were found in either the software or the documentation, we corrected as soon as possible, but the users would be told of the existence of the known mistake in the interval. So we're building confidence. We're looking for
for quality in every aspect of what we're doing. Brian, maybe you should explain the mechanism by which people corrected their, their books when you found by, by sending out listings and telling them to type them in and recompile. <laughs> well, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, these were very early days, you'll remember. Um, so we, we, had to, we had to get people used to the idea. Yes, they, they could inspect the source text, but most of the time, of course, they were given compiled libraries, even then. Thank you. Um, but just to hammer the point home, um, the spectrum of users was very wide. Um, in terms of subject background, often you, we didn't know what they were talking about. When we looked at the equations, we knew which algorithms they needed, and, and, and so we went on. Their knowledge of computing um, was often quite limited. Um, and, and I, I think David gave you a, a graphic introduction to his knowledge of numerical analysis at the beginning of the talk. That was, uh, that's meant to be a joke, by the way. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, he, he never got t too uh, caught up with that. Um, it's the, the other thing that was important, no one had a prior claim on the computing service. Um, and any facility developed had to be, the documentation had to be written um, and the advice given in, in, at, at the point where people were rather than where, where we thought we were. Um, the, the problem solution was obviously by the numerical area of the model, the mathematical model. There were, we recognized 27 different areas of mathematics that we provided algorithms for. That's actually been enlarged since then. But that's where we started. Uh, library classification was by the area of the, the numerical mathematics and statistics. So the names of the routines tied into the sorts of mathematics um, we were talking about. We had these funny names, um, e, E04 GAF, which would be E04 would mean it was nonlinear optimization, and the F meant it was Fortran, and the G and the AL I'll deal with in, in the lecture. The users understood um, the vocabulary and language of the research areas. They certainly didn't understand the mathematics in the same way. That was our job. Um, and, and so there were those issues of support. And it's a major factor in the documentation. Now, the, the selection of the algorithms that went into the library, right from the beginning, again, even in the library, was on the basis of the, the problems that the users wanted. So some of them, for instance, with all the differential equations, some of them would have um, initial value problems, and they were comparatively easy to solve. But even right from the beginning, some of them would have what we call stiff equations, um, which are much more difficult to solve, and they use completely different methods. And we needed to provide the information for that from day one. Um, we'd had a hand-down society before. The, the, the numerical analysts, in their wisdom, would toss an algorithm out of their place of refuge, and the users would pick it up. Well, we weren't going to do that. Right from the beginning, we were going to build a library. We re having recognized the areas we need, we then went to the uh, numerical analysts who wrote in that work and asked them for algorithms that we needed. Uh, and I'll be saying more about that in a minute. Um, and so, um, from the beginning, we, we encouraged the analysts to learn about the user requirements. Um, and, and to actually focus their work into the areas. And, and they were happy to do that because most, most of the numeric analysts want, wanted their work to be used. Um, a secondary factor in the building of the library was that inevitably in the library that, as it developed, there'd be cross-calling. So in every, virtually every numerical area, they would all want to call on, on linear algebra, numerical linear algebra. Um, and because of that, we had to be careful 
that in, in constructing the calling sequence, says, there was enough, enough flexibility in the calling sequence to allow the control that was required by the other algorithm and, and software developers. Um, and, and, and that worked quite well. Um, so we had characteristics for the selected algorithms, and at the first meeting, we came up with this list. Um, but we learned very quickly, um, next slide, that really usefulness just wasn't a meaningful description. Um, so we, we, with stability, robustness, accuracy, adaptability, that's the reliability aspect there, um, trustworthiness aspect, speed always came last. And, and the great Christian Reich once stood in, in front of um, Cray and said to him, your machine is unsafe at any speed. Can I ask what you meant by stability in that list? Um, but this, is, this is numerical stability. Um, so th there are ideals for the algorithms. Um, obviously the fundamental aim was to meet what the users wanted. Um, but we would provide algorithms that didn't have the qualities that we wanted if it meant that we could at least begin to solve some of the problems. But we always replaced them as, as quickly as we could. Um, and what it meant was that the whole time you, you've got the, a, a natural build-up going on. So again in the first meeting we sat down and hammered out a list of the areas we ought to have in the library. And, and they're shown in this, um, this list. The amazing thing was the nonlinear equations at the end, because I don't think we had a single algorithm at that point to, to handle them. Um, excuse me pointing, this is bad habit. Um, th this, these were, the, the battle here was a battle royal. Um, I worked with a man called John Nelder, um, who's a famous statistician. And, and David Cox, um, and, and Nelda particularly, was absolutely insistent that we ought to use GenStat and, and, and systems like that for the statistics, rather than the routines. But we did put routines in, and it was an absolutely right decision. Um, next slide. Clearly the linear algebra came first. We, as I said, we stumbled over the statistics. The sorting really didn't belong there, but um, it was included, and it's always been heavily used. The random number generators were fundamentally important. Um, and um, we never... One of the best decisions we made by default is that we realized we couldn't do the PDEs, so we gently put them to one side. And it was only later we realized that if we had committed to doing the PDEs, it would have slowed us down by several years. Um, there's just so much work involved in them. Um, the ODEs were much more important than their placing. Um, uh, and um, the, 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 the algorithms available were very much in their infancy in a number of areas. Linear programming was another area where there'd been a lot of package activity. Uh, it's a good job we included the routines. Uh, and the graphics and visualization deserved early attention. They didn't get it. We did have one or two people we knew who were even good enough at that point to have done it. But we, we amended that problem later on. And, and we came up with four gap categories of algorithmic uh, coverage. General, patchy, spotty, non. <laughs> um, and the, the ambition, of course, was to move everything into the general category. And I think it's probably true to say, Mick, we still haven't done that, have we? Uh, I think you're right, yeah. That's correct. Yes. Um, you know, there's still an awful lot of work to do in, in getting the best problem solvers. <clears throat> if, if you want, if you, any of you got family um, involved in, in finances, talk to them about the Black-Scholes equation. It gets them wonderfully excited because it, it's it's everything. This is that they use it fundamentally in, in the, the, their contract. 
I've just put this in to give you an idea of the releases. The, the first release of the NAG library um, was ready on the 30th of September 1971 on the 6A of um, Oxford University uh, with about six minutes to spare because we commit ourselves to doing it by, by that point. And then over the next um, five years we have releases of the library every year. And it, you'll see in a moment how we, we got to that point. So that's... Th th just, just let's go through them actually, one after the other. Then the, then the next one please. This one's got the linear algebra in it. You can see the great watch of them at the top there. And, and there's, there's interesting enough, some of the statistics became, began to come in at mark four. Um, and then the random number generators, can we just go back a second? The random number generators, we had one generator, set of generators in mark, mark one. But by mark six, the, the, the field had moved on very substantially. We've got a, a much better generator. Um, which then lasted a number of years, but that still changes reasonably regularly, doesn't it? Random numbers uh, tend to come and go in popularity. Yeah, yeah. It has keep getting replaced. And then um, the, the, the thing I wanted to do was to just show the numbers at the bottom here. So the, of, of, the, of the fundamental algorithms, there were 82 in Mark 1, although there were over 100 routines. Finishing up in, in each year, as you can see, with significant numbers of routines, so that after six years, there were 400 routines in the library. Thanks. Um, we wanted to use international standards for setting up the structure of the library, so we used the modified share classification index and, and found all sorts of weaknesses with it, but were able to strengthen it and get the public body to uh, adopt what we what we done. Uh, and and you, this, this is important because the, the naming of the 27 chapters we had was taken from the Modified Share Classification Index, the funny names we had. Um, when you're selecting um, algorithms, what you want to be able to do is to subdivide the areas down, as an example in a moment, numerically, so that ultimately, each algorithm you have in the library has a specific function for being in it. Um, and, the, for instance, the nonlinear optimization uh, was only partially classified, which is this slide here. I, I, I'm sorry, this is not this this slide is not very clear, but I hope you can read it. What what was clear with, with the problem types that <coughs> they're either unconstrained. Um, functions you're optimizing or constrained and then within the unconstrained you had these four positions you could it, it was a univariate variable or you could use a direct search technique but you could only do that with a, a few dimensions if you could calculate the gradient vector you could get much better directions for finding the optimal uh, minimum um, and if you've got both the calculated gradient vector and the Hessian, which is the double differential, um, obviously you could do it even, uh, even better. And, and the, the issue, of course, is looking at a problem and deciding into which of those categories it belongs. Thank you. Um, these people were the backbone of the library development, the library contributors. Um, the selection of the algorithms for inclusion in the library are so important. Um, what we had to do initially was divide um, all the contents we wanted in the first uh, releases of the library um, in, into their the subject types and, and then share them out among us. Um, and, and so you've got this, you see. The, the linear algebra uh, was, was handled by Oxford, uh, Linda did it, with her colleagues, and, and I tested all of it, great fun. So one of the things, reviewing other people's software, if you want to make enemies, <laughs> um, with, with the, 
and and you know I, you you can see that you can see the list there. Um, the I had, we had a man called Henry Neve for the G05 who did a really good job. Um, well, since I'm going to go through some of this in detail, um, let's move on, Nick. Um, we, we shared out the work, as I've just shown, for the whole library. And um, we had about already 15 people acting as contributors. From, from the six centres. But only one subset of all of that work let us down. Everybody else just got on with it um, and recognised that this was going to help them and we'd have a complete library that, that our universities could use. Remember, at this point, we're only thinking of four or five universities, six universities, five universities in Atlas. We weren't thinking beyond that at all. Um, so the um, the chapter contributors had to determine the substructure um, in their own area of activity. You know, so Joan Walsh, for example, with her colleagues in Manchester, sorted out the ordinary differential equations. Um, and at that point, there were three um, three main me methods, as I remember. And I'm, I'm not going to try, try and remember the names, but I, I remember there were three. And there was a, the, that meant that the two numerical analysts who felt they'd been insulted. It's pretty simple language. Um, and um, they had to know in their own field what algorithms were currently available um, and know something about the quality of those algorithms. Who was doing the work? And what was involved in developing new, new algorithms to fill the holes? Um, remember, these people are just voluntary. Most of them were doing this work um, and teaching in their university at the same time. Um, but their interest and involvement was such that it really drove the field forward. It broadened their own contacts. And I'll, I'll give you some idea about what that means in a minute. Um, they, were, they were delighted that, that what they spent their hobby doing, people wanted. And then they began to get a flood of correspondence from people wanting to know more about the algorithms and specific features, etc. Um, and, and, and it helped their publication records. Four, four case studies. Um, first of all, the numerical linear algebra. The uh, linear algebra, as we've said already, is crucial for the library because it, the linear algebra comes in every section. Um, Linda and her colleagues at Oxford translated the handbook from num it, for nu nu numerical linear algebra, which was written in Algol, into Fortran. What she did there when she started, there were a, there was a group in um, the states at Argonne National Laboratory, led by a funny chap called Brian Smith, who I corresponded with by email almost every day, and have done since I first met him in 1971. Um, we, we spent a, a, a wonderful evening in Ann Arbor trying to break Wilkinson's codes. That's how our friendship started. Um, he was leading the, 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 uh, the ice pack uh, project at Argonne National Laboratory. So Jim gave, um, obviously, uh, uh, Linda all, all the linear algebra. We also got something that was incredibly important. We got the blessing of Jim for the project, and he committed to working with us, which is really quite remarkable. You know, he was already the International Secretary of the Royal Society. Uh, he, he was Turing's right-hand person, famous for his work on uh, at backward error analysis and all sorts of other areas. And, and he just worked along with everybody else. Um, and he appreciated from the beginning that the distinctions between uh, numerical analysis, the algorithm designed from the numerical analysis. Numerical analysis is looking at the stability and other issues involved in a particular area. 
the algorithm design is concerned with making sure they're working in particular ways effectively. And then the software implementation, of course, is actually putting it into Fortran and Algo. Jim Wilkinson, God bless him, I don't believe ever wrote any code. He had a, a woman called Grant Peters, who was the national cycling champion, um, who, who did that for him. Um, but uh, he recognized the importance of all of those three. And when we come to talk about testing, you'll see how important that is. Jim believed profoundly in collaboration and cooperation. And that's what we were doing right from day one. I mean, that's what, that's what made NAG possible. Without it, it just wouldn't have worked. Um, many people got very touchy when you started pointing out errors in their code. And I explained a moment ago that Brian and I started our friendship breaking Wilkinson's code. You know? And we didn't have a lot of success, but we found some errors. Um, but he knew it was a shared philosophy of excellence. We get quality into the library, into the software, into the documentation, into the testing. And people knew that, knew they could trust what we were doing. Um, it would make a tremendous difference. Um, Jim also took me as a baggage porter to this meeting at Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he was lecturing for a week on, on ice pack, and uh, Cleve Moller was there and all sorts of people. There's a group from Argonne as well. Um, and um, then the second week, it was the question of going to Argonne, which is outside Chicago. Um, when um, the, the, the Italian who built the atomic bomb. <coughs> Sorry? <laughs> That's right. Um, he, the, the, he was, it, the, they, they, they started building it on the tennis court in the middle of Chicago. And they realized that really wasn't very wise. <laughs> so, so they moved the activity out to Argonne. And, and it's interesting, the move actually created some white deer but uh, the, the people have often wondered whether the two things were connected. <laughs> um, just to go back for a second, um, one of the great things that happened when we're getting people to work as contributors, particularly in numerical and algebra, they would say, well, if it's good enough for Jim, it's good enough for me. And they, did, they really did. Having said that, we, we agreed, uh, Jim and I and others, that that really wasn't a high enough standard. Uh, you know, we actually <coughs> wanted it to be correct. So Jim set up the uh, Linear Algebra Working Party, which meant there were a group, group of people meeting at the National Physical Laboratory four or five times a year from 1972 onwards, looking at algorithms in numerical linear algebra. People would fly in from the States and from Europe just to come to that meeting to be involved in the activity. Um, they're filling the holes in the numerical analysis, the numerical linear algebra offering. Um, this led to the uh, development of the, the BLAS, the basic linear algebra modules, which I think are internationally known. Um, there's the LIMPAC project, which was on linear equation solvers as well as the eigenvalue problem. John Reed uh, is internationally known for his work on sparse matrix software, and he was there from the beginning. And all the time we're updating the library. Um, and so I say Jim gave us his backward error analysis. This is for the analysis of the, the algorithms, the testing of them, <coughs> his understanding about stability, which we mentioned earlier. He had the handbook with Reinsch, um, and it was just a nice, friendly guy. When Jim died, the red wine in his, his uh, cellars, its rumour was worth three times the house <laughs> in Teddington. So it got good taste as well. Uh, the next one is curve and surface fitting. And we're going from the, the strongest area we started with to probably the weakest, the curve and surface fitting. And Jeff Hayes was at, at, at NPL. He had no initial interest, but then the moment he heard about it, he became interested. Jeff was a really good guy. Um, and um, Clenshaw, of course, was a member of the team 
at, at the National Physical Laboratory and developed his Chebyshev polynomials work there and then, then went up to Lancaster. Um, and all of the contributions in that area as they developed had the same floating point error analysis which meant you had confidence that the algorithms were fundamentally right. Thank you. Um, then we had the B-splines. Carl de Boer became one of our contributors as well. Carl was in, um, in the States. Um, and um, the first time we nearly had blows in NAG was between um, Ian Gladwell and Morris Cox. Morris was incensed at some of the comments that Ian made. And Ian was from, from Manchester where they're, they're famous for their um, directness. It's fair enough, isn't it? You'd agree that's fair enough, isn't it? I think that's absolutely And um, uh, in, 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 with hindsight, Morris said uh, that he was glad that Technis criticism because the resulting Kevin documentation was generally much better. The, the, the third chapter was Joan's chapter. Joan was the only real numerical analyst of that initial group we had. Uh, she was responsible for the order differential equations. Um, she, she decided that the Merson's method should be the first uh, initial value problem for solver. Um, she also came up with um, the, the, um, the, the boundary value solver as well. Crow's algorithm over the long term um, took over, but that was hard fought. Um, and Bill Gear, who was, um, I think, was at Cambridge, um, did um, mathematics there, um, but, but has spent most of his working life on stiff equations um, in uh, the, the uh, states. He heard an earlier version of this lecture about 15 years ago, and said it was the most boring lecture he'd ever been to. <laughs> you can't win them all. I didn't tell you that beforehand. Um, there's the exhaustive testing at Manchester, they had a, a meeting. In, in each chapter, the thing we started was having a meeting of the contributors um, so that people could focus in and, and bite into it. But George, George Byrne, um, who, who was about six foot five and quite a commanding figure, arranged a meeting of the ordinary differential equation people in the States. And, and these, these were gold dust people. Bill Gear, Alan Hindmarsh, Tom Hull from Toronto, Fred Crow, JPL, is still there. Uh, Al, uh, Larry Champagne at, uh, at um, Albuquerque. Um, and Marilyn Gordon, who sadly gave up mathematics um, and um, decided to have four children. Um, but she was quite striking. Um, <coughs> And um, what happened in that meeting was a real fight to sort out the technical language that would be used in the field. All of them had invented their own uh, way of describing things as a way of laying out the land. And what this meeting did was actually agree a common language in that area of numerical mathematics, which was, was, was very valuable. Um, the Toronto group of Manchester work very closely together. Nonlinear optimization. Now this this was another tricky area because the people at Harwell had already got some very good uh, Fortran routines. But the, the, the code was very um, individual. Mike Powell didn't believe in letting other people see how things worked because it was his. But that was no good for us, because we wanted to develop. So they gave us the initial input, and, and um, I've forgotten the name, from, from Leeds, the optimization. No, no, uh, um, no um, John was my PhD student. Um, oh, anyway, um, surely supervisor. But, you don't mean Fletcher? Yeah, yeah. No, that's Fletcher, right, sorry. Fletcher. Yeah, it, Fletcher, 
um, who was a more peaceable guy, um, but it, it didn't work. And, and, and Walter and Phil were quite individual too, but we had to do a swap of the, the leading of the contributions in that chapter. Um, and that, that came for two reasons. The library users were unhappy with the codes they got because they couldn't understand what was going on in them. Um, and also the research had moved along a lot as well. And, and Walter and Phil were, were used to sitting at the feet of Jim, Jim Wilkinson, and, and talking about the, the error analysis and everything. Thank you. Um, and so we, we developed algorithms here. There was another interesting um, position that came from that work as well. Many users who wanted to use nonlinear optimization codes couldn't control all the detail of the calculation. They just didn't know the information. So they needed an easy to use routine. But the, the specialists in the area and, and people solving major problems with these algorithms, they wanted to have total control over the calculation that was taking place. So instead of having 20 parameters, it had 35. But they could use the 35. And so in that area, we, we, we put in the, the two sets. Um, and we had three levels of solvers, problem solvers, primary routines, and basic modules. That came out quite nicely, didn't it? Yeah. Good using that one character. Yeah, that's right. Well done. So that's all I want to say on that. Right, so there were six phases that were required to have a, a, a world class library. You needed the contributions. <coughs> That work then needed validating. When it had been around there a couple of times, it was fit for assembly into the library. It then went on to be implemented on many different machine ranges. So by Mark 5, we had 44 different versions of the library in Fortran. That's different machine ranges, different compilers, etc. 16 in Algol 60. By Mark 21, we had 78 in Fortran and 39 in an equivalent uh, C library. Um, so the implementation effort was huge as well, but it had to be on the equipment um, for which it was intended. Then, of course, we had to distribute the code so the implementers would pass it to our distribution center and the, the they copy um, the software, on, most of it initially obviously on tapes. Um, and then the network came and life got a lot easier. And of course the whole thing had to be maintained when we had master versions. And, and to, to operate that, which we were doing by 1975, 1976, we're talking of at least two or three hundred people collaborating and cooperating, working together to build the library for all those machines. Um, and it's, looking back, it's quite amazing, really. But it, but it happened. Um, we had the issues of software transportability. Notice it's transportability, not portability at this point. Yeah, the library worked perfectly on the 6A. But then those wretched people at Cambridge got themselves an IBM system you know, 16-bit arithmetic, 16-bit arithmetic, it's uh, base, base, 16. base 16, yeah, that's so painful, and, 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 and chopping off as well, I think that's the company you used to work for, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, truncation, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to classify clients who had, were losing the last bit of floating point numbers. Yeah. That's right, <laughs> yeah. Abs absolutely. Um, my, my, my weak uh, response is, we had a three seconds. <laughs> and, and of course we also had the CBC 7600 in Manchester um, that we had to have it for as well which had got a bigger word lay 60 bit word lay rather than the 48 so we, we had to fill it out for that and bring it back for, for the 48 systems alright so we, we got different bases of floating point representation 
different word lengths. The underflow and overflow points on the algorithms were different on each machine range. Um, and you can imagine the algorithmic and software portability issues. Because at this point, no one had met them before. Well, they had met them before in very specific research groups. But most people were completely unaware of it. Um, we, we had some knowledge. And in, excuse the, the, the self-congratulation here. <laughs> But this, is, this undoubtedly was one of the biggest technical contributions that NAG made, because we'd actually got this wide range of experience that we were working from. Thank you. Um, the other issue, of course, was that in Fortran particularly, we, we, every um, computer manufacturer had his own Fortran interpretation. We had to come up with a Fortran subset that would work on all the machines, which is what we did. And gradually then, we put people onto the standards committee, uh, the Fortran standard committee, so we could set it in concrete. Um, and that worked quite nicely. Uh, can we go back again for a second? Um, sorry. Um, so we, we required routines which would run virtually without change to the efficiency, with the efficiency, and to the accuracy we required on all the machines that carried the library. And we're talking here a minimum of 30, 35 different machines. Um, so we needed adaptable algorithms realized as transportable subroutines. And we did this by fixing the values of cer certain constants. And, and we, well, I'll be telling you a bit about that if I get time in a moment, won't I? Oh, I see it now. Um, so, we, we, we created a, a thing called the, the NAG Library Conceptual Machine. So, the, 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 the contributor would on, only want to write a single routine which could be tailored to perform to the required standards of accuracy and efficiency on each of these different configurations. Um, and, and so, we, what we had to do was develop a, a, a simple model of the features of any computer that were relevant to the execution performance of software. Next slide. And, and this was done in terms of the conceptual machine had a number of parameters and these were fixed and, and I've rather lamely included <coughs> here an example of two of them. Thanks. So the contributor writes his or her routine for the conceptual machine. Um, the implementers then tailor it, um, and the contributor obviously provides in his implementation test for each routine the, the necessary tests of accuracy and efficiency for each machine type. We had portability wars. Um, the gentleman on um, the right there is one of David's favorite people of all time in computing. His name is Val Kahan. Val is still working at Berkeley, um, I'm glad to say. Um, and he and Jim Cody thought portability could be only achieved one way. We're going to have perfect arithmetic. Perfect arithmetic. Everybody's going to use it. No portability problems. Well, that's not true, but they didn't know that at the time. Those of us working in software realize we've, we've got to be able to model these things. Clearly, we could have just one arithmetic, beautiful. But were we ever likely to achieve it? Well, as many of you will know, the IEEE came out with an arithmetic standard defined by those two guys and, and, and other colleagues. And it's been incredibly successful. But give valleys do. In 1976, at the height of the war, he said, Brian, we're all writing portable software now. It, it accepted the concept that the, the software had to have this modeling feature for it to work across different machine ranges, because there are always going to be different sorts of arithmetic um, in, in, in the way they're implemented for specific uh, ranges. Thank you. Library manual, um, 
you've, you've, you're sick to death at that point now, so I can leave it. Um, it, it it's a question of being able to handle, write it so the, the users can, can, can use it. Um, it's got to mirror the issues in the software um, and handle the evolution of library contents. Um, it's got to support the same software on all these different machine ranges. Um, and clearly, the, the, cha the, the chapter structure within the, the library manual um, is going to be uh, the same as in the library routines. And I guess we haven't got a picture, have we? No, not. no not to worry. Well, not, well, we have got one later, but that's in my bit. That's in your bit, yeah. sorry. <laughs> well, you, you're, we, we're going to show you a, a Mark 21. The, the last Mark 21 manual printed is wider than that. Um, it's all it's all written exactly to this standard. Um, so, at the beginning of each chapter, so each of the 27 areas of numerical mathematics has an introductory chapter with background information, how you can recognise the problem types, flow charts often to help you choose routines, uh, etc. Each routine is described under 13 headings. There's an example uh, data set in the manual and the results, and the routine bears the same name as the routine it's describing. Now, th this, this also is a really tough area. So, software testing, very vague. What it means is, you've got to have testing for the algorithm selection, which is created by the contributor, the validators invariably left their mark on it too. You've got to have the stringent test software for when you assemble the library. You've obviously got to check the language compliance in Fortran and Algo 60, and then later in Fortran and C, and other languages which Mick will talk about. You've got the stuff for doing the implementation tests to make sure it's working correctly on specific versions. You've got the example programs in the documentation and the results when they come off, when they used to have it line printer, would be about yay thick and you didn't want to look at them all. So you needed tools to read it all. Thanks. Jim, for his algorithm testing, um, did an, a, a detailed error analysis of each algorithm uh, as, as described. Um, Brian Smith, is an Ockham so-and-so, is a Canadian. Um, actually, his, his roots are in Gloucestershire, but never mind. Um, and um, he, he, in Icepack, he, he used exactly the same techniques. He's a lovely guy, actually. The girl is, is my close friend. Um, the, in validating, we're certifying the algorithm selection and that the user documentation was up to the mark. Um, and, and we had tens of validators across the library. We still do. The assembly um, involved the work of many individuals, um, and this is what we sought to do with it. We had to check, obviously, that agreed standards of the software and the dot were being met in this, uh, the assembly stage. Um, and wherever possible, we wanted it machine proven. Um, I've left half of the talk this is from at, at home, but Mick's going to cover it in the last half hour. How am I doing for time? You've got some time. Okay. Um, can we bash on? Um, so I've dealt with that, I think. Um, I, I mentioned about implementation already, um, and we have at the moment um, over 85 different Fortran versions and about 43 different equivalent C versions that we're supporting. Um, these are the operating principles um, of um, the, the project. Um, this is a definition of them in a sense. The consultation, the library being for users, and, and, and the library machine, which is the, the processes we have to go through, helps all in, through all its parts. Collaboration 
which was absolutely and continues to be absolutely vital. In every generation since then, and when, remember we're talking nearly 50 years now, we've looked for the best people developing in the different numerical areas and tried to make sure we were working with them. So Marchuk, for example, who was in uh, Academic Rogs Novosibirsk, um, he's very good on the method of lines because he invented it. Um, and uh, we, we work with, we used to work with him, sadly, he, he died recently, uh, and so on. Um, so collaboration, I'm going to say a little bit more about that later, actually. Coordination as well, by, by having a coordinated activity, there's so much you can do in parallel to keep the thing working and moving forward so that it, you, you've got a new library coming out all the time. Planning, obvious. The standards I've, I've rather emphasised. Mechanisation, um, vitally important. It's an area I've never been that directly involved with, but Mick will be saying something about that. So we, the, we got to position in building the library and with our similar library ventures of designing scalable algorithms either going up to, onto all sorts of systems and all sorts of architectures, as you'll see, um, of portable numerical software. And because we had the IEEE arithmetic, because we had visualization and in symbolic computing, there's been this enormous flowering. I mean, people don't think anything of it now. They just assume it's there. But we created it, we all of us in the room, involved in computing. And, and the big thing, of course, is the people, people factor. Um, what we do is very demanding. Um, the people who worked within the NAG project, and I hope in much of our um, industry, um, have shared objectives. They're willing to cooperate with one another. There's mutual trust and, and so on. And we found we, could, we, we were able to find people um, working voluntarily who had those characteristics. Um, we've been lucky that we've always been able to find the people when we wanted to. Lots in North America, obviously many in Europe. I've put a few names down. You'll notice David's included there. Uh, <laughs> um, and, um, and also we had the critics. I mean, Stu Feldman, I'll, I'll comment about him later. Val Kahan, well, not an easy man, um, but, but uh, a very able man. Um, the only person that I've ever seen frighten Val Kahan was Jim Wilkinson. It was, it was magnificent. <laughs> We've got, and, and then looking at the Nag Library Machine groups, um, this is beating the drum. Shall we go on? Um, and the, the, the implementers, it's a thankless task, particularly earlier on, because not only did they have to do the implementation and all the testing, but that they then had to create and, and test the library itself and everything. And, and they did it. And then the next staff, um, and, and we've had some great characters. Um, um, for example, um, Malcolm Curran's the person who wrote our compiler. Margaret Day tried to sort David out in Cambridge and me in Oxford. Um, you all remember David? Um, and um, Steve Haig, who was my colleague for... Of course, Steve gave this talk with me, so his, his name wasn't put in the list. But he, he, he was my deputy for over 30 years. Uh, and there are many other people. So the, the, the organization of NAG, um, I'll move through this more quickly. Um, we started in Nottingham, for reasons I explained at length at the beginning, with a Nottingham algorithms group, with a small central office in Nottingham. Nottingham decided that we were taking up too much of their resources. And I was told, if I gave up the, NAG stu the stupid NAG thing and went back to mathematics, they would not ruin my career, which I thought was very generous of them. 
the, the same day, I got two phone calls. One was from um, D David's representative in Cambridge, and the other one was from um, Leslie Fox in Oxford, inviting us to take the group to both places. That was, that was rather nice. And we chose to go to Oxford because we'd been working directly with them, although we've always had very close relations with our friends in Cambridge. And by the, the, the computer board were already giving us three full-time posts. Um, Steve was nominally the coordinator of the 6A in, in, in Oxford, in Nottingham, sorry. Uh, Richard Tallett was at Loughborough, and Keith Fielding um, was, was in, um, in Manchester. Um, then we moved to Oxford, we had to, ch we had to change our name. I mean, we weren't told to, but it was convenient anyway. You know, Nottingham became numerical. Um, and um, <laughs> we, um, we were able to enlarge our office there, and the board funding continued, um, and we got three more um, f f full time people um, Jeff Hitchens and then Shard after dinner in Cardiff, uh, John Parkinson, somebody mentioned, um, and um, Margaret Dane Cambridge, I've mentioned already. Um, and then it became clear we needed to become um, a body, um, a separate body. Um, the, the, univer the university in Oxford were not happy um, for us to be seen as part of the university department there. Um, we, we were in the computing lab. Um, so we needed our own legal, legal status. We needed to be a limited liability company. We certainly needed to write contracts. One of my favourite experiences in, in, in that, it, this, it's about a, a little later than this, but it's a story worth throwing in. Um, we were negotiating a contract with a small company called IBM, and they're, they're really quite large, and we're, we're a bit tiny. And, and I was talking to um, the legal director in, in the States, a main board member, uh, and he was getting really disgruntled because we were trying to close out a contract and I was being difficult. And he said, I said to him down the phone, you know I can read your mind. You're frustrated by the fact that you're being nice to your customers now. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas a month ago, you'd have said, I'm going to get this guy and drive him straight through the bloody wall. And he laughed his head off. And he said, I'm going to send you the main line um, board Christmas card. He said, you're absolutely bloody right. <laughs> but we laughed at one another and he agreed, so that was all right. Um, and, but that was the, an, an example of why we needed that. We, we, we also had contracts with the Department of Defense in the States, which was non-trivial. Um, and, uh, obviously we needed the, the continuing voluntary resources, um, so we couldn't be a, a, a standard company. We needed to be a not-for-profit company limited by guarantee, associated with, but not part of, the University of Oxford. Um, we need to make a living, and we need to employ our own staff. So, the pros and cons of that, um, it kept us free from venture capitalists. We never got bought out. We could receive IP from everybody, and we were protected. We never addressed the issue of the capital base of the company, but we, 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 we did it our way through. So we're always short of resources. Um, and of course, we needed to, to develop new products and services. And we, we had subsidiaries, I'll come to that quickly in a moment. So, you know, it was quite hard, but I think we made the right decision and the company still has that legal basis. Um, and so, there's a great value to good advice, that doesn't mean anything to this audience, so can we move on? Um, we had to make an, a living, so we're now in the period 1976 to 1980. Um, we, we now have about 30 full-time staff in Oxford. Um, the funding from the Computer Board for Universities and Research Councils stopped on the 1st of August. After that, we were on our own. We had to earn everything. 
Um, there's no direct funding for the company from government thereafter except for, for contracts. Um, but, but clearly we're implementing the library as widely as possible. And um, the, we were very tempted by digital when they brought out the workstation. I don't know whether, I guess a number of you can remember this time. Digital brought out the Vax 11780, which was a phenomenal machine. We were the first people outside digital who actually worked on that machine. And we called it the Implementer's Dream. A friend of mine who's 91 and just moved home in, in Chicago has, has sent me in this, this envelope. Uh, I won't open it because you, you wouldn't be able to see it. The, the advert that the uh, deck spent um, over a million dollars on at that point, uh, implement, uh, describing the implementer's dream. And I had lovely black hair at that time. <laughs> um, I'll waste another minute as well. I had a wonderful moment. I went over to Marlborough when this was being done. And um, th they brought me into, into Boston in the, um, the company helicopter to fly home. And, and the, the, the pilot said to me, you know, who are you flying with? I said, I'm flying with BA. Oh, I said, I can put down next to BA. Mm -hmm. So in, in their helicopter, they put it down about 100 yards from the, the 747 I was flying home in. Um, and they had a, 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 a customs man to clear me through. And I went, I went up the stairs, and an absolutely splendid uh, air hostess at the top said, this way, sir, and she pointed, of course, to first class. And then I said, no, I'm an e in economy. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go back one? Um, th there's also, a, it, a, about this time, an, another a, a amusing experience. Um, so I, I spoke at the 1981 debt user meeting in, in San Francisco, in, the, in one of the big hotels. There were about a thousand people there. And I, I'd just seen off um, one of the directors from digital. And we came up to the commercial floor of, of the hotel, and the door opened, and in got Sammy Davis Jr., who had got the suite at the top and was doing the entertainment in the hotel at that time. Um, and he stood next to me. We went up to the sixth floor, and um, the doors opened, and in got four delegates, you see, standing in with us. And then the one in front of Sammy Davis Jr. says, aren't you Brian Ford? <laughs> <laughs> we went up to the 13th floor, where honestly I was sleeping, and I got out there. And as I got out, he said to me, ain't fame great? <laughs> <laughs> so, we'd better move on, I think. Um, so, obviously we're implementing we, and we've developed the, 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 the NAG product family. Um, it's worth putting up this slide for a, a significant period in the 80s and 90s. We lived off collaborative research programs. And we finished up, in the end, uh, as the principal investigator on 26 uh, research projects. I, I was on the, the main <laughs> panel for the fourth and fifth frameworks as well. And Steve was on, on one of them too. Uh, we shared between us 130 million euros. So here's where some of the money went. Um, and in the UK, we, we got grants as well. The, um, one of the other interesting experiences, Brian, my friend um, in the States, um, it was in um, New Mexico, and they, had, they were given the responsibility for running the Maui High Performance Computer Center, which is the biggest center they had uh, on Earth in the Department of Defense at one point. Uh, and I was a non-executive director for six years, and, and inevitably, perhaps, did some work um, for national governments as well. Um, and that's all good money. Um, next one, please. And we had subsidiaries, I've just flipped through these. Had one in, in, in um, the States, um, started in Carl and Brian's bedroom, um, and that's still running, not in their bedroom. 
but um, in, in a proper facility. Which would one? Because again, this is boring. We had we had a, a German subsidiary, but it, it, that's now dormant. We still have one um, in um, Japan, which is very helpful. And then the governance. We had a, 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 a council of management from '76 to 2006, um, appointed as shown in the slide. Uh, obviously, um, two from the computer board and one from the university initially when they're putting in a lot of money. Um, Steve and I were uh, ex officio members. Then, following a review, they, they changed that, that body. Um, the members of NAGA people who've worked with us. And, and there are a few hundred of those. Um, and when when this slide was done, there were only 189. But um, the slide was done a few a few years ago now. Next one, please. Um, we had three, as far as I'm concerned, great cha uh, chairman. And Joan Walsh would insist on being called a chairman. No messing. Um, Joan sadly died. Um, just two months ago. Um, David was the second chair and he suffered me for 10 years. Um, and, and took it, I thought he had a very good spirit. Um, I thought it was 12. <laughs> well, my wrist was hit, tells me it's 10. But you, you may be alright. Um, and, and then um, Richard Field um, was. Um, our third chair, Richard, sadly died um, last September. Um, we did an awful lot together. Um, let, let, let's move on from that one. And it, the inevitable, um, the, the chairmen were invaluable. We've, we've had, had so many very senior technical advisors, world figures in their own areas of computing. Jim is special simply because he, he, he was with us right from the beginning. Um, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> so, th th this, this is, this is the, the big moment, um, in a way. Um, the biggest mistake was the Ada Library, although it was mainly paid for by the Commission, thank you. Um, they gave us good stakes in the Burnham. They did, didn't they? Yes. We um, got chairman to tell you to Absolutely. Um, I, I, I mentioned Maui already. I was given this office there and I looked out the window. And if you can imagine looking, and as far as you can see, there are humpback whales mating. <laughs> it's just an amazing sight. It's the place worldwide where the humpback whales come to mate. And it's a beautiful, beautiful island. Um, have I got time to? Okay. Um, so I went to Academic Raganova Sibirsk um, as a guest of the Soviet Academy of Science. Um, and they expected me to take a library tape. And they were absolutely pissed off because I hadn't. So they sent me to Coventry. Nobody spoke to me for nearly two days. And that wasn't just on the site, that was the hotel, that was the cleaners, that was everybody. I've never been so frightened in all my life. They've got a problem with the Bessem 6, which is the computer the, the Russians had throughout the empire. Okay? Unfortunately, um, and what was happening on their space program, um, the, the equipment was going in the air, you know, one be up and then somebody try and join them. And they're always at least 100 meters apart. Whereas the Americans were getting close enough so they could just gently edge them together, which is the way they were put together at that time. Um, but th th as you can imagine, um, this was a topic of real concern, particularly to Marchuk, who was the, the, the academician in charge of ac academic drug novices, but also was the minister for science and technology in the, in the Soviet Union. Well, I, I looked at it and, and, and I, I realised that, that I, 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 got, I thought I got an explanation of what was wrong. 
they got the, the, they got the mantissa and they got the exponent and, and they were allowing the last bit of the, the mantissa from time to time to push over into the exponent. <laughs> and, well, thank God I was right. <laughs> um, and so what they're able to do is to just simply put up a guard and the thing worked properly. They never paid me for it, but they did allow me to come home. Um, and, and another, um, we had a, a number of near geniuses work with us. Um, and Malcolm, who is still working with us, is one of those. Um, and he came in one day, he said, um, Brian, I've decided I could write a Fortran 90 compiler. Fortran 90 was a new language. And I could do one in two years. And he did. So that was a big surprise. Um, We've run out of your slides. It's yours now, is it? Oh, yeah, because we're doing the bit at the end, yeah, aren't we? Yeah, you can come back to the next oh, That's right. So thank you. It, it's the intelligence stuff now. <laughs>
and we, so we distribute it on Linux machines, we distribute it as shared libraries or static libraries on Windows, we use DLLs, and sometimes we distribute it in other ways, for example, for MATLAB, we make a toolbox, and we also help people make this stuff work in, in other areas, so that we talk in languages. I almost said modern languages like Python, but Python's been around since the 1990s as well. So, uh, so the idea is that users concentrate on what they're doing, with the problem they've got to solve, and we do the heavy duty lifting behind the supplying the, the software to do that. So I just want to say a little bit about the way we pack this software together and how it, how it actually looks. So most of it, uh, Brian talked about Algol 60 and Fortran. Well, Algol 60, the Algol 60 version of the library disappeared many years ago, decades ago. Uh, but the Fortran that was used way back then eventually became merged into something that we call the NAG engine. The NAG engine is what we call the driving force behind solving all these different areas of mathematics, all the problems from the different areas of mathematics. So originally it was all Fortran. Fortran Despite being the oldest high-level language from the 1950s, Fortran is still one of the best ways to get good performance out of the modern hardware. So if you look at all the software that's running on the biggest supercomputers in the world right now, probably 50% of the software on there is running Fortran. And that's because it can generate really efficient code to get the best performance. So millions of lines of code in the NAG engine, even more millions of lines of test programs. So Brian mentioned when it was printed, the NAG library source code looked like that. I've, I've not measured it recently in, in terms of being printed, but it, it's probably more like that. But actually the test software is, is twice as good. There's a lot more test software than actual software. And lots of people are working on this all the time. Although there is a very small amount of code that was written back in 1970 that is still in the library, if Brian looked at it now, he, he wouldn't recognize it. It doesn't look the same. It's been transmogrified and changed and updated so many times. So the NAG engine, it's the bit that sits in the middle of uh, everything else. And as I said, it's mostly Fortran, but also C++ and C involved in there. And then round, round the outside, we have different variants of the NAG library that take advantage of the NAG engine. So we have the NAG Fortran library, we have the C library, we have Python wrappers around the engine, uh, and various other things. The idea is that we try to make the NAG software available to anybody, no matter what kind of environment they're running in. We want it to be as portable as possible, so they, they're all taking advantage of the one engine. Uh, the, the other advantage of having the one engine like that is, in the old days, we had various libraries. We had the Algo library, we had the... Ada, the much maligned Ada library, we had the Fortran library, we had the C library, we had the Pascal library, and probably various of as well. Yeah. When we have a problem with any of them, somebody finds a bug, for example, in one, oh no, we've got to go and fix it in all those different places. Well, with the NAC engine, we don't have to do that. It's one place, the bug gets fixed, it's in the NAC engine, and all the other libraries benefit from that. Or, on the other hand, if we put new software into the engine, all the other things benefit straight away from it. We don't have to go and translate it to all these different languages, which was a large part of the effort in the early days, was translation. Uh, this is the picture that, that Brian mentioned. This is the NAG documentation, the Mark 21 library. We've not printed this thing for, for quite a few years now, and, and I took this photograph just before my, this, this was my personal copy of the NAG library manual. Uh, a few years ago, we had a clear out of uh, just, just tidying up the whole of the, the NAG office in Oxford. And this, I took this picture just before it went into a skip. We do have a, a couple, at least a couple more copies that we've saved for posterity. But you can see documentation really important. Um, this, this is just a, a, a taste of the top of one routine document. And the one I've chosen is uh, a routine that finds the roots of a polynomial. This documentation and, and, and the software was written by Brian Smith, who, who Brian's mentioned a few times. Uh, so, uh, interesting connection there that uh, called Brian the, the root of something. I can't remember what you said. <laughs> Very rude, I think. <laughs> I'll tell him to do it. 
So, the Mac Fortran compiler Brian also mentioned, as I just said, all this high level programming language, but it's still, it's still going strong. It's got, these days it's got object oriented features in it, it's still continuously developed. There'll be a new version coming out later this year. Malcolm Cohen, who wrote the world's first Fortran 90 compiler that works for Mac, still works for Mac, based in our Japanese office. He's the editor of the Fortran standard, so he makes sure that everything that goes in there makes sense. He's a, he's a, a very focused chap. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't take kindly to fools. And, uh, uh, actually, I was, at, I was at a supercomputing conference uh, a few months ago, and this guy came up to me and he was talking about Malcolm. And yeah, I know Malcolm very well. He's usually doing something like this. <laughs> You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, another thing that's come along in very recently for the Mag Library that's, that's turning out to be really important is a thing called algorithmic differentiation. Now, you, you heard Brian talking about lots of the Mag software, particularly for optimization problems. It needs we use it to supply derivatives of a function or, 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 or whatever. Algorithmic differentiation is a way of generating these derivatives automatically. But it's not only that, it's a way of finding sensitivity. So if you want to solve a mathematical problem, and the input to the problem that you're solving change by a little bit, algorithmic differentiation can tell you how much the results that you get will change if you change the inputs by a small amount. So that's really useful information, and I, and I hope that the pictures I show will explain why. So it basically it's calculating the derivatives of, of the output arguments with respect to the input arguments. So here's a, an example of what that can get you. Uh, this is some uh, software that was used to generate a model of a car, uh, I'm not sure, I suspect it was a VW, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and the idea is that they want to work out by changing the design of the car, how to reduce the drag of the car, because obviously the fuel efficiency and so on, you want it to be as, as little drag as possible. So by using algorithmic differentiation, what they could do was take the, the, uh, the model that they use that solves all the differential equations involved in calculating the drag. And they work out how much each point on the car's surface, so for example, maybe the wing mirror or the, or the wheel or the, uh, the wind, wind screen or whatever, figure out exactly how much each point on the surface contributes to causing the drag. And in other words, if you change that point on the car's surface by a little bit, will it increase the drag by a lot or a little bit or reduce it and so on? And that helps them design a, a car that's really efficient. Now, when they did this, they solved this model without using algorithmic differentiation, and they realized it took approximately 44 seconds to, to solve this problem. They applied the AD version of the same software, and it took 273 seconds. Now, something like four or five, no, more than that, isn't it? Six, six times, uh, it took six times as long. But if they'd have done this in the old way, before they had the algorithmic differentiation software, it would have taken, they calculated that it would have taken several years to get that same information. So it's a really efficient way of designing, uh, in this case, cars. Uh, another example, talking about uh, the engineering of waterways. A big and an important thing these days is flood prevention. And you can analyze the course of a river uh, based on the way that the riverbed flows and the way the, the, way the river curves and the, the sediment on the bottom and figure out what's a good place to change the structure of the river to avoid flooding. So by working on the, I, I don't know where this river is I'm afraid to say, but what they figured out was that by putting uh, a small uh, wall on the edge of the river at a particular place, they could avoid the outside edge of the river silting up and causing floods. So again, it's something that's really important these days. And anyone who, who knows Oxford will know that one end of Oxford is particularly prone to flooding. So if we could figure out a way of avoiding that, then we, we would certainly be very, very well. There's rain forecast, you better hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, collaboration again. 
We work very closely with lots of the hardware people these days. Intel give us pre-release hardware. They use our test software for testing their own software. So that, uh, and the reason for that is because in the old days, they would bring out new versions of their software, and we'd write back and complain, and say, we're well, not passing our tests anymore. So they said, oh, can you just give us your test programs? And it would save us the bother of going back and forth. So that, that still goes on. We work with ARM, big uh, chip designers. We build the ARM performance library for them. We work with AMD, Intel's competitors, <coughs> uh, and also Cavium with their Thunder X systems. I think this, this is my last slide, except before I pass back to Brian for the yeah. winding up. Uh, so some of our university collaborators, we work with people all over the world, but I've picked out a few of, of the people here um, working with, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce his name, in, in Amsterdam. Uh, we work with Case Installing in Delft, uh, Pete Jimak in Leeds University, in the Centre for Doctoral Training there. Uh, this, this one is one that I'm most closely associated with, because I'm on the Industrial Advisory Board for this doctoral training centre in Oxford University. And we work with people in Lancaster and Sheffield and various other things. So the point is we're still collaborating in the same way that we've always been. And that's really that's been the, the basis of NAG's success over the years. Thank you. Thank you. I think these are quite short. Can we? So we've got the uh, scalable algorithms and portable software. We've done the IEEE. Uh, fundamental to all of this was the underpinning numerical mathematics, numerical analysis, numerical software. And we would say we've had some influence in all of those three areas um, from the work we've done. Is that the last one? Uh, I think there's one more after Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you to everybody. Th thanks. <laughs> thanks for having well, I'm delighted that how few of you have fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, are there any questions? Would you like the mic? Yeah, would you? Very good at this. Right, then. Brian, may I thank you hugely for telling me that Jim Wilkinson got the better of Kahan because Kahan was extremely rude to me. Uh, but my question is slightly related to that, and that is, um, in the bad old days, as we all know, every computer was very different, and you had to take an allowance of that. With our Triple E, they're all, um, in my view, slightly different, and. Is that improve things? And to what extent are the exotic features like sine zeros and nans and God knows what used in the current uh, mathematical libraries? Maybe I'll answer that one. Um, yeah, so IEEE arithmetic's made things a lot simpler for us because we can usually count on the fact that the arithmetic on, on any machine will, will probably be, be okay. And I, I mentioned that I do like to still test it. Taking account of signed zeros, does anybody does it, anybody want to know what a signed zero is? <laughs> okay, it's, I won't tell you then. Uh, <laughs> but, but okay, a signed zero is supposing you've got a large number, but you divide it by even larger numbers. You keep doing that, eventually it will underflow to zero. But if you're, the number you started off with was negative, it will underflow to what's called negative zero. And in IEEE arithmetic, negative zero is, compares as equal to positive zero. So they're, they're equal to each other, but they're different. Uh, we also, in IEEE arithmetic, have, I, IEEE arithmetic have infinities and nans. A nan is not a number. So if you do something silly, like take the square root of a negative number, you'll get a nan. Well, we have to try and guard against all that kind of thing in the Nike Library. So the optimization routines will check whether, when you evaluate your objective function, they will check whether you've accidentally computed a NAN. Sometimes people do it on purpose and expect our software will still work properly. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it does, but usually it doesn't. It, is, that, is that a good enough answer? Or? Yes, it doesn't exactly solve all the problems. 
it's not solved all the problems, and there are still arguments. In, in fact, right, okay, so, so last year, Kahan got into a big row with a guy called Fred Gustafsson, who came up with an idea for completely replacing point arithmetic. And they had a, a stand up, I, I wouldn't call it a row, they had a, 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 a robust discussion at a meeting in California last year. And I wasn't there, but I heard that. Uh, it, it was quite uh, heated. It was extremely rude. Kahan has been extremely rude to many people. He's, he's always been a friend to Nag. Yes, uh, he has, actually. I mean, but this is absolutely true. Um, and um, he doesn't take any prisoners. And I said, the only person I've ever seen cowed by him, cow, was Jim Wilkinson. Um, but, and, and he's had a brilliant series of Brian Smith, my friend, was his first. Um, but, and I think they're up to about 12 now, and all of them have made a major, all of them have made major impacts in, in computing. Mm. Any other questions? Uh, actually, first a question, then a comment. Uh, first question is: Is any of the KDF9 code still extant? Because there are people here interested, I'm sure. Yeah, um, I haven't got one. We'll, we'll find out and let you, let you know. Yeah, it's David Holdsworth. Yeah, fine. Um, and and if, if anybody else is on another machine range that wants information, I realise I ought to said more bad implementations, really. Yeah, I don't know if you're with the Thank you. Thank you very much. And... No, <laughs> 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 We've all got the same problem. Anyway, I was just going to say, kind of, it's really useful hearing all this because it's, it's not history because I remember it. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> Uh, and uh, I worked at the Met Office and we implemented the NAG library quite early on, on when you had an IBM and, and, uh, and I was responsible for user support and uh, I always thought it was a good thing and I always got a lot of stick from our users because in your priority list of one to five, the top of our list was number five, speed, speed beat everything. Yeah, stability would be nice, but you know, reliability, but speed beat everything. And in fact, the things that were really successful in the Met Office were not actually using the library, because what actually happened, what was really successful was the documentation. Because the scientists came along and suddenly realized there were other algorithms to use. They would then look at the code. They then discovered the implementation of a, uh, a tridiagonal matrix inversion or whatever would actually be based on an underlying subroutine that inverted n simultaneous matrices, right, and then they, and you just put n equal to 1, and so they just strip it all out, and then just you know, remove all the all the subroutine calls, because they're expensive, and actually re-implement your code to make it go faster. But the one that was really successful was when we got our Cyber 205, uh, which is the CDC supercomputer that was faster than a Cray, and it was faster because it did 32-bit arithmetic, twice as fast as 64-bit arithmetic, and we'd done our numerical analysis, and we knew we could do numerical weather models in 32-bit arithmetic, and it found, and your code found, single error precision in the double precision arithmetic. And that was really helpful. And, and, and I mean, obviously, your equations are difficult Yes. Mind you, if you can solve them, there's a, there's a million dollars going. <laughs> Are you still in Wilkinson House? Um, yes. Yeah, that's up the family road, yeah. Okay. Well, 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 it's, yes, yeah, it's the short answer. Yes. Yes. Okay, I drive past it every now and then. Heather covered over it for us. Okay. Sadly, Heather, of course, died a year or two ago. Okay. But we still have contact with David, his son. We might have to move out of Wilkinson House in the next few years because the lease is coming up before we... Um, they're, they're planning to build houses on the, the site, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. It's still up in the air, I think, that's right. Do you own it, then? 
No, no, you don't, obviously, no. Okay. We no. Sort of Mm. Not a capital company, mm. but having said that, it's not really stuff just doing that. No, no. Sure. Mm. thank you. Yeah, what you did in the early days in the 70s sounds very like the present open source model where your customers can actually look at the code. It, it, is that still possible? And um, do you allow sort of external users to actually interfere with the code in any way? We try not to, and the reason we try not to is because we don't want them to make changes that will accidentally come up with the wrong answer or, or do something wrong. That's, that's the same reason why we don't any longer send out patches to the library as source code unless people to come it themselves. However, well, some people are really desperate to get hold of the code, so we do make exceptions for particular customers. They have to be good customers. We won't, we won't give the source code out to anybody. But some people we, we trust enough to let them see the <laughs> On a similar vein, um, source, uh, the open source model is people supply the code free and, and you, you'll pay for consultancy services if you need it. Um, is that how you operate? Could, it, could I get hold of an ag library? Or would I have to pay for it? Well, it, <laughs> you can get trial versions for free, but, but in general, we, we don't give them away, except as collaborative use. So if, if you were to say to me, I'm working on some new code to solve a particular problem, it would be really useful to have an ag library, and when I finish this code, I'll, I'll give it to you so you can put it in an ag library, we would arrange some sort of collaborative use license, right. which would be at no charge. But in general, people don't get it from that. No, that figures. Thank you very much. It was a superb presentation. Thank you. Uh, um, was it a conscious change or just something that evolved and just. Well, we, we, we used to have trouble because people had the, the entire source of the line, but actually making it work is a hard job. It's still a hard job today that we do as much of it automatically as we can. We have tools that, that, that generate uh, machine characteristics and things like that. So what was happening sometimes was people would take that code and compile it in a slightly different environment than it was designed for, and it, it just wouldn't work properly. And it, it was too much danger of people getting wrong answers from that thing. Mm -hmm. and so, so we reluctantly stopped. And, and there was probably more to, more to it than that, but that, that we for me was... a bit more. precious as well. I mean, by then we developed a reputation for quality. And, and the, the danger in that circumstance is that somebody, if you, excuse me, I'm sure you wouldn't be, is, is incompetent. But they, they don't recognise their incompetence and they blame it onto your code. And, and the, our reputation was precious to us, so perhaps we were a bit precious as well. But we that sort of contrasts with the Met Office use where they wanted the source. Yeah, well, well, we may have contributed to them kind of yeah. closing the door. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and the, 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 other, the other thing you say is that, as, as, as Mick indicated, um, we're always open to an, a mutual understanding, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. We're basically only giving it to people we trust for our particular reasons. It, yes, and, and it's, yeah. it's, it's in a proper context. Yeah. You know, it's not casual. Mm. If that makes any sense. Mm. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Well, ju just to say that I mean, my recollection of the 60s and 70s as an electronics engineer, but playing around with computers and thinking I was good at Fortran programming, fitted very much your description of this uh, people factor. You know, in, in the UK and I know in Canada and in America, people did collaborate openly and they talked to one another and there was that sort of atmosphere. I'm now long since retired, maybe I don't really understand these, things, but if I look at the universities now, particularly in the UK, but also in other countries, seems to be professors have to just publish and publish and publish and the last thing I want anyone to do is to know what they're really doing and they certainly don't want people to understand their papers because if nobody understands them they can publish them seven or eight times over with slightly different words and it really is like that you know and I, I just wonder if, you know if something new came along could this happen again that's all I, 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 
believe the answer is yes. Um, all I know is that um, whenever I go to the States now, all right, I go and stay with people who I've worked with in NAG mainly. But in, in universities like Stanford um, and um, Caltech, we still have very close relationships and work, work very collaboratively with them. Um, so I, I believe that spirit is yes. still alive. Um, I, I mustn't say any more because we'll get over into politics and <laughs> that would not be very wise at this time of the afternoon. Okay. Yeah. I, I think we better stop there because people have, have travel plans, etc. But um, I'm absolutely fascinated. I'm not, I'm not surprised people didn't go to sleep. I kept thinking of questions and three slides later I got the answer, <laughs> which is a jolly good way of, of leading you through. And um, I, I think the example of successful collaboration is a real, you know, it deserves a, to be much more widely known because successes of this level and look at what it's become from where it started is quite phenomenal in my view for, for someone who didn't know the story. And I've really enjoyed hearing it. And I can tell you as an aside, they were just as nasty to internal IBMers in the UK. <laughs> and I, I gave a talk here a few months ago and I told a story involving myself where we, we ended up laughing but winning. So, <laughs> so a shared experience. But thank you very much. Brian and Mick for, for absolutely fascinating and I've, I've, I've really found it well eye opener, door opener, uh, really fantastic. Thank you very much indeed.